Welcome everyone to the Liberty Classroom course, History of Economic Thought 1, Classical Economics and the Marginal Revolution. I am your instructor, Robert Murphy, and we are now on Lecture 21, Eugen von Bombaberg, Part 2, in this scintillating three-part series of an economist who, in addition to being brilliant, has a great name, Eugen von Bombaberg. To refresh your memory, in the previous lecture, I gave the very brief biographical sketch, and then I focused on Bumbavirk's treatment of what is the interest problem, the way he set the problem up that needs to be explained. And then I walked you through quickly three rival theories or three previous explanations that Bumbavirk critiqued. The most important for later purposes of which was the so-called naive productivity theory. So now in this lecture, I am going to give you what Bumbavrik said the right explanation was. And then again, next lecture, I will discuss the, uh, the fallout, if you will, from Bumbavrik's work in this area and explain how modern Austrians have treated it uh, for, for good and ill, as we'll see. Okay, so, Bumbavrik's solution to the interest problem. So he called his theory an agio theory, where that term agio re referring to a premium, right? So what he's trying to explain is, why is it there's apparent undervaluation of capital goods? Why is it that when you buy capital goods in the present, you have to pay less for them than what you expect their services will yield for you down the road. And so it seems like there's this this premium that you end up earning. So why why is that? And so he called his theory an agio theory of a premium because we'll see where this premium comes in. So he says, this is a quote now, present goods are, as a rule, worth more than future goods of equal quality and quantity. Well, let me read that again. Present goods are, as a rule, worth more than future goods of equal quality and quantity. And Bavavrik said that sentence, that insight, was the, quote, nub and kernel of his explanation of interest. So this is, this is big, and I'm going to keep coming back to this, that when you ask Bavavrik, where does interest come from? Why is there interest? Why is the interest rate positive? How is it that capitalists can earn this apparently endless and effortless flow of wealth? He's going to say, okay, you ready? Present goods are, as a rule, worth more than future goods of equal quality and quantity. That is the explanation. That's the starting point. And everything else flows from that. Okay, so let me show you how that statement, if it were true, solves the problem the way Bumbavrik has originally defined the problem. Okay, so first of all, let's just think through what, what does it mean if we say present goods are worth more than future goods? So I'm going to say here in this PowerPoint, suppose a bushel of wheat today is more valuable than an airtight claim to a bushel of wheat to be delivered in five years. All right, let me say that again in slightly different This is crucial. You, you have to make sure you understand what the time frame is here because this, this is where people get mixed up, and this is why it gets so tricky to speak coherently on this topic. That's where all the confusion comes in. Right now, a bushel of wheat available to you right now, that is going to have a higher value to you than someone who's giving you a piece of paper. And what is that piece of paper? It's a legally enforceable airtight claim to a bushel of wheat that's going to be delivered five years from now. So what, what I'm comparing is the value to me of the bushel of wheat available immediately on the spot versus a claim to wheat that won't be delivered for five years. But, and this is important, don't worry in this discussion about somebody reneging on that promise, right? So we're not worried about, am I actually going to get that bushel of wheat in five years? 
assume that it's an airtight claim. I'm not worried about that. What we're focusing on is the difference in time. The fact that do I want a bushel or how do I feel about the marginal utility to me of a bushel of wheat available right now versus a bushel of wheat that in my mind right now is not going to be available until five years from now. All right, so Bumbaver, you know, his, his nub and kernel was saying, as a general rule, present goods are more valuable than future goods of like kind and quality. Or sorry, like uh, kind and quantity. So, for example, it's somebody might say, I would prefer uh, a diamond ring in five years over a bushel of wheat available today. So is that an example of a violation of Bumbarek's rule? Well, no, because a diamond ring is not the same kind of quality of, as, as a bushel of wheat today. Or someone might say, I would prefer a bushel of wheat that's in fine condition in five years rather than a bushel of wheat right now that's got insects crawling all over it. But that's not a violation either because those are different things, different you know subjective satisfactions and so forth. So... If we correctly, using subjective value theory, specify what do we mean by a good being the same thing, units of comparable quality and so forth, Bumbavrik is saying you would want, typically, you want the goods sooner rather than later. Present goods are more valuable than future goods. Okay, so if that's the case, subjectively, if I get more, if I attribute more value to a bushel of wheat today rather than a legally enforceable claim, a piece of paper right now that entitles me to a bushel of wheat to be delivered in five years, well, using Menger's new subjective marginal utility value theory, Bumbavrik says, okay, that means the market price of a bushel of wheat today is going to be higher than the market price right now of a claim that entitles me to a bushel of wheat to be delivered in five years. Okay. Because, again, the whole point of the marginal revolution, subjective value theory, was to say people's subjective evaluations of goods on the margin explains their market prices. All right, now I'm going to tie it back into the examples we were talking about in the last lecture, now that we've got this framework in place. A brand new tractor today in a sense, is like a technological claim that's going to entitle the owner to extra wheat this year, extra wheat two years from now, three years from now, all the way up to ten years from now. So we're not talking about a piece of paper that's a legally enforceable contract. Now we're talking about a physical relationship. We know if you own a brand new tractor right now, there's a sense in which that will entitle you to, will produce for you will cause to be in your possession extra wheat at the end of this year at the end of next year da, 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 up through 10 years from now right we're just continuing the example that we invented last lecture and in particular suppose that the extra wheat in each of those years could be sold at that time for a thousand dollars so that new tractor today it's like somebody giving you 10 different slips of paper one slip says at the end of this year you're going to get a thousand dollars worth of wheat the second slip of paper says at the end of two years you're going to get another thousand dollars worth of wheat the other slip says at the end of three years and so on and so forth but now notice remember what we already talked about a few minutes ago a piece of paper saying a bushel of wheat to be delivered in five years is less valuable to you than a bushel of wheat right now, and hence will have a lower market value. So, put all this stuff together, that means a, something that is going to give me $1,000 worth of wheat five years from now is not right now going to have the same value as $1,000. Its price will be lower than $1,000 today even though five years from now I will be able to sell it for a thousand dollars. So I hope now everyone's starting to see, oh, this is how it all fits. So put it all together. How much would you pay right now for those 10 pieces of paper? 
you would not pay $10,000 right now for them. Because in a sense, those pieces of paper are giving you $1,000 at the end of this year, another $1,000 two years from now, three years from now, 10 years from now. You wouldn't pay $10,000 right now for all those pieces of paper. And so then by the same token, if someone's got a brand new tractor that I know will give me extra wheat a year from now that will have a market value at that time of 1000 extra wheat two years from now that at that time will have a market value of 1000 I'm not going to pay $10,000 right now for that new tractor because present wheat is worth more than future wheat. I'm only going to pay, let's say, $9,000 for the tractor right now. So if I go ahead and do that as a capitalist, I invest $9,000 in this tractor today. And then over time, you know, next, at the end of this year, I get paid my $1,000 from the farmer who rents it. End of year two, I get the $1,000 rental payment from the farmer who rents it. And so on. By the time this tractor, after 10 years, is totally decrepit and we just throw it out as junk, I will have collected $10,000 total but I only put in 9000 up front, and so I have reaped an interest return. And Bambarik is going to say, look at you. You now can go consume $1,000 worth of goods and services and do the whole process again. So now you have this apparent source of effortless and endless wealth because you were in command of that $9,000 of monetary capital or financial capital up front. And we've explained that phenomenon ultimately by the fact that present wheat is more valuable subjectively than future wheat. Okay, so that's that's it. That's the theory. That's the explanation. Now you might say, okay, but we're only 12 minutes into the lecture, Murphy. Surely there's more. Well, of course there's more. So, Bumbavrk has thus explained the existence of interest by the higher subjective valuation of present versus future goods Full stop. That's the theory. That's the nub and kernel. Now, he wasn't done. He's a productive man. He says, okay, let me now talk about why is it that as a general rule, present goods are more valuable than future goods. Okay, so he's already explained interest. Interest is due to the fact that present goods are more valuable than future goods. There's an agio on present goods. There's a premium on them. And once you understand that, that explains interest. That's why capitalists earn this apparent flow of effortless and endless wealth. It's because what they're doing, let me put it in different words, they're taking present goods and exchanging them for future goods, for claims on future goods, if you will. Because the capitalists right now, the capitalist could spend $9,000 on wheat and consume the wheat right now. He chooses not to. He invests it, in a sense, in a technology that will turn into future bushels of wheat. And it ends up turning into more bushels of wheat than he has command over right now. And so that's the sense in which he can consume bushels of wheat all along the way and not impair his position. Because... 100 bushels of wheat today trades for more than 100 bushels of wheat down the road. So if you're willing to wait, you can consume bushels of wheat all along the way. I'm, I, I keep saying the same thing from different angles to just make sure it clicks with you guys. Okay? So, again, once you grasp that relationship, you see, okay, the first thing to say when we want to explain interest is, Present goods are more valuable than future goods. That explains everything. But now, Bambavrk is going to push it further, and he's going to start explaining, here's why present goods typically have a higher subjective value and hence market value than future goods. And in particular, he's going to give three famous grounds for this higher valuation, or you could say three causes of the higher valuation of present over future goods. So the first cause is that there's going to be typically better provision in the future. The, the way Bambavrk talks about it is he says the supply and demand relationship in the present versus what we expect it to be in the future typically means that there's going to be less scarcity 
that the goods are going to become more abundant relative to our wants in the future than they are right now. So, for example, we might expect to have more apples or more wheat 10 years from now than we do right now for various reasons. And so because of that fact by itself, that's a reason we would tend to prefer to have a unit of goods available right now rather than not to be available until five or ten years from now. So let me just say that again. Just because, or solely because of the fact that we think our stockpile or our availability of wheat is going to grow over time, that by itself would be a reason if somebody said, hey, do you want a bushel of wheat right now or do you want this piece of paper that's an airtight claim entitling you to the delivery of a bushel of wheat five years from now just because of the fact that I'm going to have more wheat five years than I do right now, that by itself would make me say, give it to me right now. On the margin, I'd rather have a bushel of wheat right now than five years from now. So in modern terminology, we would say because of diminishing marginal utility. That is, as the quantity available rises on the margin, the utility drops. Just that factor alone is what Bumbavrik's capturing in this first ground or first cause. And that by itself is part of why you would expect there to to be this um, default presumption in favor of present goods being more valuable than future goods. Okay, now we're moving on to the second cause that Bumbavrik gave. And this is the systematic undervaluation of the future or future wants. So, and again, this, now these, these causes I'm listing, Bumbavrik thought they were independent. They were separate factors contributing to the actual result that we see in the real world, that present goods typically have a higher value than future goods. So, in the real world, we expect to be better provided for down the road. But now Bambara is going to put that aside and say there's a separate thing. It's the systematic undervaluation of future wants. So here the idea is even if we expected the supply and demand considerations in the wheat market to be the same five years from now as they are right now, you would still, because of the second ground now, prefer to get a present bushel of wheat rather than a bushel of wheat to be delivered in five years because the utility that you're imagining you yourself getting five years from now is lower than the utility you're imagining you're getting today from a bushel of wheat. And it's this particular ground, it's simply because that satisfaction is occurring in the future that you're discounting it. You're not taking it as seriously. You're not giving it the priority that you would give the same, if you will, satisfaction right now. All right, so this is like a pure discount on future satisfaction or utility simply because it's in the future. So notice this is different from what we talked about in the first ground. In the first ground, yes, we were explaining why you would want a bushel of wheat today versus one five years from now, but it was because that we're going to have more wheat in five years. And so the margin utility of wheat consumption is lower at that point. But now in this second ground, Bumbavrik is arguing, even if the margin utility at the moment of consumption were the same, nonetheless, right now from our present vantage point, looking and considering that future margin utility, we discount it simply because it's remote. Now, if you're really an overachiever and you want to get into the weeds on this one, Bambavar gives three separate reasons for this second ground. All right, so don't get too confused, but just so you know. He said, okay, there's three separate reasons of why people might systematically discount future, uh, the satisfaction of future wants merely because of its remoteness. So one is like a faulty imagination, just it's hard for people sometimes to visualize the future and to really imagine themselves in a future condition. And so right now to make decisions 
fully taking into account the position you're going to be in down the road. And so that, that, you know, that's like a mistake, if you will, it's just faulty imagination. Okay. The second element in this, he attributes to just weak willpower that even if you can fully imagine it, like you could say, you know, yeah, I, I really wish it, that would be great if I was in, in great shape six months from now when I go to my high school reunion, all those people will be oohing and on over me and what great shape I'm in, how great I look. And I can, I can picture it perfectly. It's not, it's not that I'm having trouble imagining it. I can picture it perfectly. It's just, I don't have the willpower. I don't want to go to the gym. I don't want to change my diet. I get present enjoyment from eating these potato chips and man running on that treadmill right now would really be a bummer. I don't want to do it. And so even if there's a sense in which your future self would say, Oh, come on. It totally would have been worth it for you to stop eating those chips and get on the treadmill in order to be in great shape right now. You just, you have weak willpower. You don't do it. Even though you kind of know you would get more happiness from it. So you can argue about, about that if you want. I'm just telling you what Pumbavik said. Okay. And then the third element here, again, we're still talking about the second ground for why there's this, general tendency for present goods to be more valuable than future goods. The third element here is uncertainty about the future. And so Bambavar says that part of why we systematically discount the satisfaction of future wants and don't attribute satisfying like future hunger as much as we don't give it the same priority as present hunger is just the future is uncertain. Right? So that, so here that that's not, irrational if you will that that's perfectly sensible that i'm hungry now i have a bushel of wheat right now i could use to satisfy that hunger and now if i'm thinking about okay five years from now i also probably will be hungry and so what kind of wheat will i have then and so if somebody's giving me the choice of a bushel of wheat now or that part of what's going to influence your decision is the fact that you're not really sure right now what conditions are going to be like five years from now, whereas you're pretty sure how things are right now. And so Bambavrik is saying, for that reason, that's a quite sensible, if you will, reason that we tend to systematically undervalue future want satisfaction merely because it's in the future. Okay, now we're moving on to the third ground, the third ostensibly independent reason or factor in why is it that people tend to value present goods more than future goods. And this is what Bambavik referred to as the technical superiority of present goods. And let me, before we get into this, let me just make sure you know, it's this one that was notorious. So this is the part of Bambavik's own theory that got him bogged down in really technical debates with other economists, big guns like Irving Fisher. Um, and this also is what later Frank Fetter and Mises and Rothbard would point to and say, whoa, this is ironic that Bambavrik beautifully blew up the productivity theories in his volume one and yet inexplicably came back in his own positive theory and apparently relapsed into a productivity theory himself. Isn't that, isn't that ironic? All right, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about that part of the contract. We'll, we'll defer that discussion till the next lecture. But I'm just highlighting for you, this is where people thought Bambavrik went awry. Everybody, all other economists have no problem with his first two causes. In fact, Irving Fisher would inc incorporate them into his own theory of interest that now modern neoclassical economists use is what they think is the modern theory of interest. But it's this third cause that caused all kinds of problems. So we'll defer the controversy till the next lecture right now. Let me just, for the remainder of the time here, explain to you what Bambavrik had in mind with this. So again, he called it the technical superiority of present goods. And what did he mean by that? He was saying, well, you need to understand, first of all, that 
capital intensive production processes are more physically productive. And so Bambavik said, this is what a lot of economists had in mind when they moved beyond the merely naive productivity theories and they recognized that there was something there was something more to be said. When you when you notice that using capital goods in a production process caused output to be higher, there was something else besides the fact of just, well, yeah, you can make more with a tractor than without. And so what Bambavark, the, the way he tried to explain this, the way he described it, is he said that wisely chosen roundabout production processes are more physically productive than less roundabout ones. And so we say, okay, well, what, what the heck does that mean? Well, it's like this. Uh, the the best way I can explain it is with a, a simple example. So let's say you're someone, you're thirsty, and you're near a stream of water. So what what do you do? Well, you recognize, oh, water quenches thirst. Okay, so what are you going to do about that? Well, a very direct, non-roundabout approach is for you just to walk over, kneel down by the stream, cup your hands, and start you know, bring the water to your mouth that way. It's a very direct approach, and it'll quench your thirst temporarily. Another approach would be for you to go climb a tree. You get a coconut down. You're, of course, on an island that has coconut trees for this example and streams. And you crack open the coconut, and you hollow it out, and so now you've got this coconut shell and now it's like a little bowl, and you use that in order to scoop the water up. And that's, a, you know, once you've gone through the trouble of making that thing, that's a better way for you to drink water than just using your hands. But that's more roundabout. So here, what does roundabout mean? It means you didn't directly go at your goal. You took the roundabout way. Somebody who saw you climbing a tree, knocking down coconuts, might not at first realize that you were you were intending to go get water from the stream with it, whereas you know someone seeing you kneel down and put your hands in the water, I mean it's pretty clear what you're doing. An even more roundabout process would be if you got a house that's near the stream and you say, you know, it's really a pain that I got to walk to the stream every morning to get a drink of water, and so you go make a shovel. And then you start digging a trench and, you know, years later, somebody sees your place and they see that you've constructed this uh, irrigation line that that takes the, the water from the stream up into your kitchen. Right. So you're, you're in the story. You're much more industrious than I am. I would have no idea how to build something like that. But you do in this story. Congratulations. Maybe you learned it in Liberty Classroom, a different lecture series. All right, so you're getting the water from the seam coming into your place, but this was clearly an extremely roundabout process. Right? You first had to go make the shovel. And somebody said, what are you doing that for? And you say, oh, because I'm thirsty every morning. It wouldn't be clear. Well, making a shovel, what does that have to do with you? You can drink the shovel? So you see how it works. But why would you do all that stuff? Well, of course, because... If you tried to quantify and said how much, what volume of water, how many gallons of water would I yield from these different production processes per hour of my labor, for example, you would conclude that if I'm disregarding the time element, building that trench has the biggest payoff and then getting the coconut has a, the second biggest and whereas that direct roundabout, or sorry, the immediate non roundabout method of me just sitting down and cupping my hands, that's the lowest payoff in terms of gallons of water per hour of my labor. But again, that's if we disregard the time element. So it's not clear that I would bother digging the trench and going through all that because that's a very long process. So, yeah, ultimately, when that was done, I could look back and say, oh, for the 
such and such number of hours I put into this project, I'm getting a lot more gallons per hour because now at this point I have thousands of gallons coming in. But that doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to embark on that task because for one thing, in the the beginning, I'm going to die of thirst. I couldn't postpone drinking until the that thing was dug and I had water coming in my kitchen, I would have died long earlier. Depending on how thirsty I am, I might not even have time to go do the coconut approach. I might have to, in the beginning, if I'm really thirsty, go and drink from the stream directly. And only once I've satisfied and staved off that immediate death from thirst, can I consider doing a more round, roundabout process. Okay. So th- this, I, I had to boil it down for you guys very quickly. This Bumbavik develops over many, many pages, but that is his theory, okay, of of how the the adoption of more capitalistic roundabout processes causes the physical output per unit of input to grow. That Bumbavik thinks it's just an empirical fact of the world that a wisely chosen more roundabout process is more physically productive. So you could have a more roundabout process that isn't more productive, but you would be stupid to adopt it. Why would you do that? So the the idea is if you have more time to work with, you can pick a more roundabout process that's more physically productive so that you're going to be rewarded by by deferring the arrival of the consumption good. You're going to get more units of it. And, And so in doing that, you end up creating intermediate capital goods along the way. So this is the framework that Bambavar came up with to systematically explain and handle the fact that when you use capital goods in production processes, you end up with more than if you didn't use capital goods. Because the capital goods are all ultimately produced from the original factors of production, namely labor and land or natural resources. Okay, I hope you guys are all right. Now, coming back to the problem of interest. If Bumbavik has now explained to us this fact, this empirical fact of the world, that longer, more roundabout processes... Let me, by the way, just very quickly go, go off on a tangent here. Longer and more roundabout are not interchangeable terms. If they were, then Bumbavik would have just said longer. Again, roundabout means you're not directly attacking your goal. So he even gives an example where um, if you're trying to knock down a coconut from a really high tree, if that's what your goal is, the more roundabout process might even be shorter because the a roundabout process is like going and getting an, a, a stick from somewhere and, and turning, you know, getting a, a pole and then going and knocking down the coconut with the pole as opposed to you just trying to directly climb the tree. If it's really tall, maybe you can't do it. And so Bambarik is saying in a contrived example like that, the more roundabout process is actually shorter in time than the less roundabout process. But again, once everything settles down and everybody's behaving rationally and they've got the low-hanging fruit, as it were, the point is if you wanted to get a more physically productive process, you could pick a more roundabout one, but you would necessarily have to wait longer because the idea is if there were a more roundabout, shorter process available that was more physically productive, then why aren't we already using it? So so that's the logic, that once things are settled down and we're in equilibrium, it will be the case that if you want to adopt a more physically productive roundabout process, you're going to have to wait longer for it. But that's because of a selection mechanism. It's not by definition. Okay. Stay with me, guys. Don't worry. <laughs> We're coming back. This, this, that was the most complicated part of this lecture. We're coming back now. So assume that you're okay with Bambavik's framework about roundabout processes. So that means if you are willing to devote a resource, like a gallon of water or a barrel of crude oil, bushel of wheat, If you're willing to devote a resource into a longer project, a project that takes more time, 
you will be able to get more physical yield. We're not talking about value right now. We're just talking about physical facts of the reality. So if, if you say to me, hey, I have a, a barrel of crude oil. Do you want it now or do you want it in five years? Bumbavrik is pointing out that once you now have this background knowledge and know that in general, if you start a production process that's one year in length, the yield will be such and such. If you start a production process that's two years in length, the yield will be higher, measured in physical units of output. If you start a three-year production process, you can get an even higher yield for the same input of physical factors. So when you realize that, you say, oh, so that is another completely independent reason that I would have a preference to have goods available in my possession now rather than down the road. So for some, like a, a barrel of crude oil that I'm going to use in some capitalistic production process, say I want to put it in a, in a process that's going to yield me uh, uh, output 10 years from now. If I have that barrel of crude right now, I can invest it in a 10 year process. If I get the, if someone gives me a piece of paper entitling me to a barrel of crude next year, well, then I'm only going to be able to invest that in a nine year process if what I ultimately want is the finished product 10 years from right now. And if someone gives me a piece of paper entitling me to a barrel of crude nine years from now, at that point, I'm only going to be able to invest it in a one year process. So if I've earlier convinced you, or at least you've seen where he was coming from, when Bumbavert claimed that wisely chosen longer processes are more physically productive than shorter ones, he's now saying, surely that's an independent reason that I would have a preference for present goods over future goods. Because if the goods are resources like land or labor or capital goods that I can invest in a process, the sooner I get my hands on them, the longer the process can be that I invest them in. And this isn't a matter of time preference. He's saying this is a matter of quantity preference. So even if we're talking about the finished product being delivered in 10 years from now, so, you know, that time is, is set. So we're not talking about having the consumption sooner rather than later. Still, the resources I'm going to invest to make that product that's going to be available in 10 years I want to get them sooner rather than later because the sooner I get them, the longer the process I can invest them in. So I hope you at least see where he's coming from. But Bavrik thought, surely that is a different thing going on. That's not the same as me saying I systematically undervalue future satisfactions. No, this is a, is a subjective preference for present goods that's emanating from physical facts of nature. Okay, that is the wrap-up for this, and I will continue this discussion of the controversy in the next lecture.